last couple of weeks, uh, our teaching team has just done such a tremendous job talking about missing the mark, and uh, we're going to continue on that. Um, not exactly sure where we're going to go next week. Uh, one of the topics they're going to talk about is the unpardonable sin and, uh, and how we address that as individuals. And, and uh, so I hope we get to get to that because uh, that's one of those uh, subjects that everyone's kind of curious about. We all have questions about, so we're hoping to get there uh, shortly. But uh, what, a, what a good course has... Uh, what a good course it's been, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Those watching online, I hope, uh, I hope you're uh, staying awake tonight and taking some notes and following along because uh, uh, we, we think this is important. So uh, uh, missing the mark, we, we said that this was the definition of sin, uh, that when we look at Scripture, that uh, Scripture is really talking about the idea of it's an archery term. And, and if you've been a part of the class, I don't have to go into great te- detail. Lane's done just a tremendous job uh, covering the idea. But just uh, any little uh, percentage off in our aim changes the outcome of our shot. And when we think about missing the mark or when we think about sin, uh, we oftentimes naturally think of sin as the bad things that we should not be doing. That's one of the things that people think about when they think about religion or coming to church, that it's a list of things that you can't do. Don't do this, don't do that. And, and we probably get that uh, uh, from the Ten Commandments, right? A, a lot of the Ten Commandments is things that you should not do, right? It's, it's the don'ts, it's the don't murder, the don't steal, the don't commit adultery, the don't bear false witness, the don't uh, covet. But we want to look at uh, a different way that we also miss the mark this evening. Uh, you know, we, we want to look at the idea of sinning by disobeying or by delaying and listening to the voice of God in our life. Uh, that's what we're going to look at today. It's not just following a list of rules. It, it's, it's also disobeying or delaying obedience when it comes to hearing God's voice. And we're going to look at a story that a lot of people would consider a kid's story. Uh, it's a story, a, a narrative that we find in the Old Testament. We've learned it in Sunday school. For those of you who've grown up in the church, it's a story of a Noah. It's considered to be a kid's story, but obviously it's a, it's a real story, and it's a story of the reluctant prophet. So uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And, and I want to stop for a moment at the very beginning, and, and we know this, but I want to kind of drill down on this point because it, it's important in the business of our lives to remember, to remind ourselves that God is a God who loves to speak. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a little bit uh, wigged out uh, by people who, who talk about hearing God's voice all the time. Have you ever met people like that? Like, God told me to wear the blue socks, not the red socks. God told me, uh, oh, I said red socks. Isn't that awful? Oh, I hate the fact that I even hate, oh. So for, last night, uh, see, we're already on a rabbit trail. Uh, this week, the last two nights, uh, my wife and I have been away at a pastor's conference. And uh, last night was a uh, one-game um, playoff of, of, of the baseball uh, playoffs, the New York Yankees versus the Red Sox. I was so excited. The best rivalry in baseball. The game is played in Fenway, historic Fenway Park. Our, our service got over, and as soon as it got done, our sessions, I, I ran to the lobby, uh, uh, the restaurant lobby, so I could watch the game. My daughter, who's away at college, got in her car and drove after volleyball practice to watch the game with me, and by 9.30 at night, the game was practically over and now Freudian slip I said Red Sox that's not uh, uh man I'm so upset with myself for even mentioning the Boston Red Sox today mm. but the point of the story was this that you have people who hear God so you know people just seem to communicate with God they talk to God they hear God in, in ways that that I just don't like, you know, I prayed that God would give me a front parking space, and he did. I, I prayed that God would remind me of, you know, this, and he did. I prayed that, um, and, and, and sometimes we get wigged out by that, and, 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 and maybe if we go, I don't hear God quite like that, we'll start to think, well, God really doesn't speak, or at least he doesn't speak to me. Or maybe in the busyness of our lives, we, we just go at 100 miles an hour, right? And we don't slow down enough that, that our ears aren't keen to the voice of God. So, so we're stopping. We're drilling down on this point for, for a moment because this is where the story of Jonah begins. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And I said this, and I'll say it again, that God is a God who loves to speak, that God is the God who created the spoken word. And, and not only did he speak, create the spoken he created with the spoken word uh, we, we see that whenever God created he he said let there be he said it 
He said, let there be, and there was. John chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This all occurred through the voice of God. So that God is a speaking God, that, that God is a God who wants to communicate. You remember when God created Adam and Eve, he spoke to them. That, that he wanted to have relationship with them. And the Bible would say that he would come and he would communicate to them face to face and in the, in the cool of the evening. And all throughout history, we see God speaking. And, and he speaks in different ways, right? We, we obviously, we, we see places in scripture where he speaks with an audible voice. We see where he spoke through his prophets. We, we see where he speaks through circumstance. We, we see where he speaks through the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that the Bible is so important to us because it is God's word given to us. It's, it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it's transformational. It's, it's the words of God. And, and when we get our Bible, we literally believe that the original uh, uh, gift from heaven to us were the words of God. Now, of course, there's translations and there's paraphrases now, but, but the original gift from God was his word to us. So when we talk about hitting the mark, part of hitting the mark in our life is going to occur through hearing his voice and then obeying his voice. So number one, hitting the mark requires hearing his voice. See, it's not just following a list of rules and, and the Ten Commandments are good and, and, and understanding that there's certain principles and doctrines and things that we should build our life around, but from the day-to-day -day practicality of, of living a sanctified life before God, uh, uh, there are going to be times where God is going to want to speak to you, and, and there's going to be times that God is going to speak to you. And in order to hit the mark in your life, you're going to have to get good at hearing his voice. So this is what will happen. The Lord, uh, the word of the Lord will come to you. You say, I don't really hear God's voice so good. Well, well, you, you, have, to, you have to cultivate what that is. Uh, in the course of your spiritual journey, you have to learn, okay, was that God's voice or was that me? You have to test his good and perfect will, right? And over time, as we mature in Christ, we start to recognize that still small voice and we go, I'm pretty sure that's God. Pretty sure that's God. I'm pretty sure that's God's nudging. I'm pretty sure that's God's leading. So the word of the Lord will come to you and God will speak to you. And he'll speak to some of you in some very specific words. And his words will be this. His words will be to change something, to move into a new direction, uh, to, to obey what he's saying to you. And you will, at that moment, you will have a choice. You'll have a choice. You'll have a choice to say, will I do what God wants me to do or will I not do it? Will I try to hit the mark in this situation or I'll just go, you know what? I'm not that interested in, in fulfilling his purpose in this area. And honestly, the conversation is gonna be just like that. There's gonna be a still small voice, right? You're gonna be in a situation. There's gonna be a feeling. Uh, there's gonna be a push. And, and, and you're going to recognize God's voice and you're gonna to have to ask yourself, is this something I'm going to do? I just, you've been in the, we've all been in those situations and we're not being hyper spiritual here, but we've all been in those situations where you go, I just felt it. I just, in my gut, in my spirit, in my mind, in my heart, whatever terminology you put around, you go, I just knew God was giving me a nudge, a push, a, a voice, whatever verbiage you want to put around it. And then the question comes down, am I going to listen? Am I going to do that? Or am I just going to let it go by? A couple of, a couple of Sundays ago, I shared a story. Uh, people have commented a, a lot on my, uh, my wife giving her earrings away. If you weren't here that Sunday, I'll just paraphrase real quick. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were in the food line, and my wife was going through the checkout counter, and uh, a lady said, your earrings look nice. And, and, uh, and my wife just felt... Again, it wasn't the thus saith the Lord. She didn't, she didn't hear a voice from heaven. She just had a little prompt, a little nudge, a little, you know, whatever it might be, a little push. And she said, oh, you like these? Why don't you have them? And she gave the earrings away. And it turned out to be a great illustration for me. And a matter of fact, some kind person in the church heard that story and sent her a gift certificate to Marshall's this week. So it worked out for her too. So now she's got, you know, now, now, she's, got, uh, now she's got a couple of bucks to buy. So, so if that was you, thank you for, for doing that. That was very, very kind. Um, but, but the question comes that to me is this, in this setting, when we talk about, uh, let's just say, 
I, I didn't ask her this, but let's just say that she felt that was a nudging of the Holy Spirit. Now, it, may, it may have not have been the case. It may have just been the nice thing, the right thing to do. She felt like this is going to be a good witness or whatever. But, but maybe, it, maybe she felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit. If she did not give those earrings away at that moment, would it have been sin? Would she have missed the mark in that situation? And you say, well, she didn't murder. She didn't steal. She didn't commit adultery. She didn't bear false witness. She didn't covet. As a matter of fact, it was the other lady who was coveting her earrings right? She's the, she's the one at fault here. But if she didn't give those away, would she be sinning? You go, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I want to walk through life with that kind of pressure, with that kind of guilt, with that kind of, I, 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 we're talking about fulfilling God's good and perfect, not just, not just following a list of, of do's and don'ts, rules or whatever. We're going, is the Holy Spirit leading us? Is God every single day aiming us to what he wants to accomplish for that day. So, so listen, God will speak to you. The word of the Lord will come to you. He is a speaking God, but here's the bad news. Maybe bad news is not the right, right frame. Uh, the good news is God is going to speak to you. The challenging news is this. Oftentimes, maybe, maybe almost all of the time, when God does speak to you, he's probably going to ask you to do something you don't want to do. Have you ever noticed that? Like when God prompts you, he's probably going to, he's going to take you out of your comfort zone. He's going to make you sacrifice. He's going to ask you to do something that's not really natural or normal for you. Uh, when he does that, he's often going to ask you to do something you don't want to do. Why? Because God thinks of others first. When, when, be, because God thinks eternally because God thinks of his glory. For us, we think of ourselves. We think of the now, the present. We think of how this is going to make me look, how this is going to make me feel. Uh, God has a completely, and our nature is what? It's sinful. So when I think about the things that I want to do, it's not usually serving others. It's not usually serving God. It's usually serving me. So when it's the voice of God, when it's the voice of Brian, I'm interested in that. Because Brian's going to benefit. When it's the voice of God, usually it's going to take a little bit of work or effort or sacrifice on my part. Jonah says this, as the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and he told Jonah to go into the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness had come up before me. And just like what we said a moment ago, when God speaks to us, usually it's something we don't want to do. In this case, God speaks to Jonah, and immediately it's something he didn't want to do. Why? Because Nineveh was Israel's absolute foremost worst enemy. They were the Boston Red Sox, right? <laughs> Israel hated the Ninevites. All right, so we have to go here. I hear people yell. Last week, the Orioles played the Red Sox. And never in the history of my life did I ever root for the Orioles more than I did last week. I need, and the Orioles, though they were a, a blessed failure for you all season, they were a brilliant success for me last week. They beat up on everybody they played. They, they played in the last six days like they hadn't played all season. And, and, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving credit where credit is due. They did their job. I'm so thankful. Anyways, so... Nineveh was absolutely... See, Lane's not a sports guy, so you're never going to get any of these stories from him. He's going to talk to you about Star Wars. Rick's going to talk to you about the Lord of the Rings. You know, I don't... I watch that stuff, but it's not a religion to me. I don't know half the things that are going on. You're going to get sports from me. So, but Nineveh here was Israel's absolute foremost worst enemy. Israel hated Nineveh. Jonah hated Nineveh. Why? Uh, you kind of need to understand the history of Nineveh or the Syrian empire here. Uh, the people of Nineveh during this time were so incredibly brutal. They were the thugs of the world. When they would attack a nearby nation, they would be so ruthless in, in, in the way they would handle their captives. Uh, they would be so destructive. They, would ask, they wouldn't just take over a nation. They would torture the people. So much so, get this, if you lived in a nearby nation, in a nearby village, in a nearby town, and there was a rumor, and historically this happened, there was a rumor that the Ninevites might come and 
take over, might come seize your village, your town, your nation. Historically, all uh, entire nations, entire people groups would commit suicide because they would rather die at their own hand than to, than to turn themselves over, their families over to the Ninevites. They would rather die because they knew what, what, what horror was coming their way. I don't want to be too gruesome, but I'll give you a little bit of the gory details. But what would happen, the Ninevites would come into a city. This was a pagan nation. They would come to take over a city, and they would kill all sorts of people. They would rape the women, and then they would kill them. They were known to even rape young girls. And they would take the men, and they would skin the men alive. And then they would take the men, skinned alive, and they would bury them in the desert sand. And you can imagine just the, the, the anguish. They would bury them up to their necks and then they would take their tongues and they would pull their tongues out and they would, I, I know this is gruesome, but they would, they would drive a stake through their tongues so they would go crazy just, just dying of thirst there in the desert. And then if that wasn't enough, that once they finally died, they would cut off all the heads of the men and they would create a pyramid of heads outside of the city to, to say to the rest of the world, this is a city that we conquered. They were so brutal, so ruthless, so feared, so against God. This is why Jonah hated them. And this is why he wasn't interested in obeying God. He wasn't interested in, in, in going to him. Uh, probably some of it was fear. He was an enemy. But, but two, he, he wasn't interested in, in going to help Nineveh in any way. And later we'll see in the narrative that it goes even deeper than this. Uh, Jonah knows that God is merciful. He knows that God is a merciful God. He knows that he, if he goes and preaches, he says, if I obey and I go and preach, and in the unlikely circumstance that Nineveh would humble their hearts and repent and turn to God, I know that God in his compassion will forgive them, and I don't want to see them forgiven. That, that's at the root. You get to the end of the narrative. That's at the root of part of Jonah's issues. So let's review for a second. The word of the Lord is going to come to you, and you're going to have opportunities you're going to have to ask yourself, am I going to hit the mark on this one or am I going to allow it to pass by? And you're going to think, okay, I, I, I understand this is what you want me to do, God, but I don't want to do it. See, it's easy for us to say, well, Jonah, you know, he should have just listened to God and it would have worked out good for him. But in our own lives, you know, we have our reasons. Jonah had his reasons. We have our reasons. God will say, I want you to forgive that person and move on. And you go, yeah, I don't want to. Or God might say, I want you to be generous. And you go, you know, I've earned this. I'm not, I'm not going to give that away. Or, or God might want you, this past week when the evangelist Greg Hubbard was here, he was talking about separating ourselves from stuff, from, from sin, from relationships. And you go, but, but I love that. I love the comfort of that. I, I love how that makes me feel. It's, it's an indulgence. That's, that's something that, that, that I need to be a part, in, a part of my life. What we're saying is we don't care what God says. And, 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 and in, of, in all of us, there's a little bit of Jonah, isn't there? And so, so some people will miss the mark by just saying no, but other people will miss the mark because of a delay. Hitting the mark requires urgency. Because the word of the Lord will come to you and you'll say, you know, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not sure if I want to do that now. Maybe I'll do it later. And see, for some of you, you guys are Wednesday night people here. You go, I, I typically obey God. When I hear God's voice, I typically obey. But there's a little bit of a lag time sometimes. Some people just flat out go, I don't even take the time to hear God's voice. Some people get to a place where I go, I hear God's voice, but I just say no. But then the next level is I hear God's voice. But, but if I'm honest, there's a little bit of a delay in my obedience. I want you to know that Delayed obedience is really disobedience. Delayed obedience is really disobedience. Question, is it a sin if I ultimately obey, but it just took me a while? I, I did it, but it just took me a while. Listen, you can tell the maturity, the spiritual maturity of a person between the distance of the command and the obedience from God. You can tell the maturity of a believer. You can tell the maturity of your own life, your spiritual maturity, in the time it takes you to hear God's voice and obey. 
And if there's a lag time, there's a problem. If the distance is short, then we're mature. If the distance is long, it's immature. The question was, if I delay, is it sin? And I'll il- illustrate it this way. Uh, my 15-year-old, he's an Eastern Shore boy. He was born in the Eastern Shore. He likes Eastern Shore things. Uh, I'm a city slicker. You've heard me talk about this. I don't get hunting and fishing and being outdoors. I don't, I don't understand that. Like, you know, I don't understand mosquitoes and, you know, walking around with your shoes off. I don't understand any of that. My, <laughs> my son, uh, he's gotten into hunting. And I don't know anything about hunting. I, we didn't have guns growing up and, and uh, you know, outside of New York. Uh, other people had guns, different kind of guns, but we didn't have guns like, you know, there. And uh, so we just didn't grow around with that at all. And uh, so my son, he's learning. And there's some great guys in our church who've taken, they, they just see that, they're, that, that Briggs is lacking a macho, you know, Eastern Shore dad. And they go, I'll be that guy for you. So, so they've taken him under his wings. They take him hunting or, or whatever. And, and I've gone with them a couple of times and not not a lot but a couple of times and uh, and 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 I haven't been there when my son shot a deer he's got a couple of deers but I haven't been there when he's got I haven't seen him get one uh, but I said how does it go he says like this he says so we set up the rifle and we wait for the deer to come and and uh, we set up the you're going to see how ignorant I am to all this, but I'm doing my best. They set up the scope and he, he, he looks in it and he goes, and so the guy will stand over my shoulder and we'll pick out what we're looking for. And then the guy will say, now, you, you got him in sight? Yes. You ready? Take a deep breath. Exhale. Now, get him. Now, now imagine for a moment though, when, when this you know, gentleman in our church tells him now, and, and then my son goes, yeah, not right now. I'll do it in five minutes. Right? There's a very good chance. Yeah, you said it right there. In, in, in five minutes, much less five seconds, that deer might not be there. Right? He's probably not going to stick around waiting for some, you know, 15-year-old redneck kid to shoot him in the back of the head. Right? He's going to move along. Right? The same thing. Uh, the, the now is important in the instruction. The now is important. And there's times, I think, when, when, when God tells us to do something, there has, in order to hit the mark, there has to be a sense of, there are times where there's a sense of urgency. Imagine if, uh, again, we'll pick up my wife, and, and the lady says, I like your earrings, and, and she feels a prompting in her spirit, and she'll go, yeah, I'm going to just, I'm going to pray and fast on this one. I'm going to go home, I'm going to fast a couple days, and then if I come back and she's there, then I'll give the earrings. Right? There, there's a sense of urgency where we, now's the moment. This is the opportunity. This is the strategic place that God placed you in. God lined this up for now. And we have to come to a place where we just don't hear God's voice and we're not just willing to obey God's voice, but there's a sense where we go, there's a confidence when God speaks, I act. God speaks, I act. There's an urgency because if you don't pull the trigger then, there's no target to hit later. There's no way you can hit the mark. Five minutes. That deer is long gone. Listen, sometimes a de- delay is a, is a tactic that the enemy will use. A delay is all the enemy needs to let the opportunity go by. And sometimes we know that. We go, if I just wait for a second, this will move on. And then whew, I didn't have to do that. But to hit the mark takes an urgency. John 1, 3 says this, it says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarsus, and he went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. And after paying the ferry, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsus to what? To flee from the Lord. He's not even trying to, he's not even, if the target is this way, he goes, well, then I'm going that way. Jonah says, I don't want to go there. I don't want to have anything to do with these people. They make me angry. So he finds a way. He creates a way out. Listen, God will speak to you. And he's going to give you an opportunity to hit the mark at some point in this week, in this month. It's probably going to be something you don't want to do. And I could almost guarantee the second that he speaks his voice, if you look around, there will be a boat nearby sailing in a different direction for you to get on. The, the enemy is just going to make it that easy for you. You're going to go, I could do this. Oh, or I could do, I didn't even know that. Oh, or I could do that. And you'll always find a ship moving in the wrong direction. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So let me ask you this question. If you get on the boat, is it sin? It's not murder. It's not stealing. It's not adultery. You say, why do you keep coming back to that point, Brian? Why do you keep landing on that? Because this is how we regularly justify missing the mark in our life. We say this. We say, I'm not a bad person because I don't steal. I'm not running around on my wife. I'm not embezzling from my company. I never murdered anyone. He said, but Jonah ran from the Lord. He headed for Tarsus. He went to Joppa. He found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fee, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsus to flee from the Lord. Do you, do you, I didn't know this today. Do you have any idea? I've never been to that part of the world, so I don't know these types of things. I had to, I had to research it. Do you have any idea how far off the mark Tarsus was from Nineveh? I, I would have never known this. 2,500 miles. 2,500, uh, if you're like me, that doesn't even mean anything to me because I have no idea what, uh, 2,500 miles is the distance from New York to Las Vegas. That's like God saying, go to New York and you go, yeah, I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> I mean, that's how far off he missed the mark. In today's world, that would be about a 38 hour drive apart from New York to Las Vegas, 38 hours by car. During Jonah's day, sailing, 2,500 miles would take him one year of sailing. A year of his life, he goes, I'm going as far away as I can imagine. He sailed from Tarsus to flee from the Lord. That's a long way off. You know, there's some people maybe here watching. God has spoken something to you. And in some place along the road, you didn't just say no. You ran from that. You ran. Maybe some of you, you're here on Wednesday night, and you say, I, I didn't really run, ran, but, but I've kind of drifted. And over the course of my, my, my life, since God spoke, I just kind of drifted. L- listen, if Either you run away from the will of God or you drift away from the, given enough time, you'll find yourself 25 miles, 2,500 miles apart. And you'll wake up one day and you'll go, how in the world did I get here? That slow drift. When we disobey the commands of God intentionally or even unintentionally, we, dri- we start drifting. We start separating, our, separating ourselves from him. And that's the Jonah in all of us. And it can happen suddenly. Uh, um, not suddenly. It can happen. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Not suddenly, um, like in small increments without knowing it. Not gradually, but yes, gradually. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with gradually. I don't know. Sounds like two. I don't know. <laughs> so, what happens when we run or we drift? Usually what happens is this, thanks be to God, God fights against our, our own self-damaging efforts. I'm gonna end this on, on a good note today. Uh, 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 usually God is going to fight against our own self-harming, our self-damaging efforts, but not in the way that we would think. In the story of Jonah, what happens? He sends a storm. He sends a storm. He says, I'm not even going to let you get, I don't know how many miles he got, but he says, I'm not going to let you get 2,500 miles. He says, maybe, you know, maybe he got a couple hundred miles offshore. Maybe he got, I don't know how far he got offshore when God said, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to make this easy. I'm not going to make it easy for you to run away from me. And some of you in this room, you know exactly what that is. You go, I tried to run, I tried to drift, and, and it seems like everywhere I go, God's showing up going, no, no, no. No, I'm not going to let you go that far. You ever play bumper bowling? You know what bumper bowling is? Now, now they have these things. When I was a kid, you know, before they gave away participation ribbons, you actually played sports and you actually were lousy at it. So you would go bowling and, and you wouldn't hit a pin. It would go in the gutter. You go in the other gutter. You go in this gutter. You go in that gutter. You know, you say, what was your score? You say, I got nine. You mean on that whole? No, 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 the whole 10 frames. I got nine. <laughs> You know, you're like, that's not good. No, that's not good. I got a nine. And, and they don't want people to suffer like that. So now they put, they put bumpers. They put things in the gutters, 
right? So you go this way and you could bounce off this and bounce off this and bounce off this and still get a strike, right? And you go, oh, I'm pretty good at this. Like, I, th- thanks be to God that when we start to try to drive our lives into the ditch, into the gutter, oftentimes he goes, yeah, I'm not gonna let that happen. Nope, not gonna let that happen. Nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And, and he does it in a way that is a little bit counterintuitive to us. He, oftentimes he does it in the way of storms. He, he does it, and we don't have time. Lane does a great job talking about, uh, you know, storms and, and, uh, and, the, and the sea and the imagery that God uses when it comes. But, but we just know that sometimes God is just going to, he's going to show up, and he shows up in a storm. He shows up with a fish, and it's his grace. It's his grace for Jonah, and it's his grace for Nineveh. And there's a, just a crazy passage of scripture. Uh, the men, this storm comes up. You know the story, but I'll paraphrase quickly. The storm comes up, uh, a storm just un, uh, unusual for that region. The, the seasoned fishermen, this, this sturdy ship, all of a sudden they go, we're not going to make it. And these men, they come up with this idea. They say, surely God's upset. Surely someone has done something wrong. I don't understand how, how all of this works, but they go, we're going to find out who it is. So they, they pick lots. They do some kind of lottery system. They, they, you know, they pick straws or whatever it might be, and, and all indications point to Jonah. And they go, are you responsible? He goes, yeah, it's me. It's incredible how God uses that. And they say, what did you do? Who are you? And what did you do to bring on this thing? And, and now Jonah chapter one, verse nine, listen to the words. Jonah answered. He says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord. Really? Are, are, you, are you worshiping the Lord right now? At this point in your life, are you really worshiping the Lord God of heaven? He says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. If I'm on there, I go, really, you worship him because it looks like you're running to me, son. It, it looks like you're missing the mark that God has for your life. It, it's not murder. It's not stealing. It's not adul- adultery. But it looks like you're missing the mark here. And, and catch this. And your disobedience, your unwillingness to hear the voice of God and obey the voice of God is impacting my life. That's big. See, oftentimes we think my private rebellion isn't hurting anybody. Wait, if I miss the mark, hey, I miss the mark, and I'll deal with the consequences of, of that sin, and, and God and I will deal with that. But, but it's not hurting my marriage. It's not hurting my kids. It's not hurting my job. It's not hurting my church. It's not hurting my testimony. It's not hurting. It, it's baloney. We think our private rebellion isn't hurting anybody. Don't kid yourself. When you miss the mark, other people miss out too. They do. Jonah's on this boat, and these guys go, we're going to die if we don't address this. If you don't address what's going on here. See, hitting the mark requires a lifestyle of worship. Worship's not just coming and doing your one hour on Sunday. Or your, in order to hit the mark, it's hearing God's still, small voice regularly and being obedient quickly. It's the little daily uh, uh, recalibration where God just says, okay, we're going to just today in your quiet time, today as you're walking with the Lord, today while you're hearing his voice, today while you're praying, today while the Holy Spirit kind of, you go, okay, we're just going to turn one inch there, two inches there, three inches there. We're just going to keep honing you in. We're just going to kind of keep directing you back. And in that lifestyle of worship, then all of a sudden you go, I'm hitting the mark. 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 I see my sin habits far, falling less and less. I, just over a period of time, uh, God is molding me and making me into his image, and I just I look more like him. It's not my doing. I just He says, do this, say this, go here, and I go, okay, I'll do it. All right, I'll try that. All right, I'll be obedient. All right, I'll lay that down. All right, I'll sacrifice. And over time, he's tweaking before long, we go, oh, man, I hit that target. That was a bullseye. I had nothing to do with that. But God was all in that. God was all in that. God did that. So how do we sum this up? Uh, the bottom line this week, it, 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 see, missing the mark or hitting the mark is not just about a list of do's and don'ts of sin. 
It's not just you need to follow these rules or you need to, you know, uh, cut this stuff out of your life. It's coming, to a place, it's coming to a place where you go, I know the word of the Lord is coming to me. The, the, the Lord, listen, the Lord is speaking to you on a regular basis. The question are, are you hearing it? And you have a choice when his voice occurs, when you hear his voice, you have a choice, a daily choice. Are you going to obey? Or are, you diso- diso- are you going to disobey? Are you going to turn the channel? Are you going to button your lip? Are you going to, you know, turn the conversation to something more positive? Whatever it might be, you get that check. You get that, that, that red flag in your spirit. You, you get the Holy Spirit going, warning, warning, warning. And immediately you have that choice. All right, am I going to listen or am I going to do what I want? And in that decision, you're going to determine if you're going to hit the mark or if you're going to allow the opportunity to go by. You know, some of you say, man, I want to see God do great things. I want to see signs and wonders. I want to be able to lead people to the Lord. I want to experience miracles. How does it take place that over and over we get to a place where we go, okay, God, I'm listening for your voice. I'm growing in confidence that that's you. I'm growing in confidence that when I'm obedient to you, you're going to deliver in this thing. And when he speaks to you, Instead of looking for the ship heading in the wrong direction, you go, okay, it's you and me, God. We're in an adventure here. We're going to do this thing. I don't know how this is going to play out. I hope you don't leave me hanging here. I hope I don't feel like an idiot, but I'm going to give this a try. Here it goes. So Jonah goes down to Nineveh, and what he expected to happen, happened. He speaks the word of God in boldness. The people of Nineveh repent. The arch enemies lay down and give their lives to God. And for a period of time, there's a revival, there's a renewal that comes to the nation of Nineveh. And God's compassion for Jonah and God's compassion for Nineveh occurs. Was it around the mountain? A little bit, but eventually God accomplishes his mission, his point. Eventually, the arrow hits the mark. That's what God wants to do in us. I want to pray for you today before, uh, uh, before we leave. Um, isn't it nice to have a teacher that gets a class done way before schedule than way after schedule? I'm just saying, I know some of you work long days, you're tired, you're hungry, you haven't been home yet, and I just take your needs into consideration. <laughs> just want you to know that. <laughs> hey, let's pray together. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes today real quick? And uh, I know this is a teaching night, but uh, what good is it if we get head knowledge and, uh, and our hearts don't change in your own way? Uh, today, I trust the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And maybe uh, he's been shining a flashlight in a certain area. Maybe he's, maybe he's put a finger on, a, on an area and you went, ah, oh, that hurt a little bit. But, but you know today that God had you here for a reason. And he's trying to tweak some things in you and you... you um, you have a decision to make. Am I, going to, am I going to allow God to work off that area? Am I going to allow God to work in that area that, that I would hit the mark? That I wouldn't just try to, you know, stop sinning and I wouldn't just try to behave better and I wouldn't just try to, you know, watch my mouth or, but, but, that, but that I would allow on a daily basis, on a regular basis, go, God, what are you saying? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to accomplish? How do you want me to live? How, how, do, how do I take this one and only life you've given me and use it as worship as unto you? I pray, God, that... Uh, we would see practical steps, that there be application to what you've spoke to us out of Jonah chapter one today. In Christ's name we pray.